Tech Freedom Initiative. My name is Sofia Monterroso, and I am the Senior Officer of Programs and Operations at Artistic Freedom Initiative. Led by immigration and human rights attorneys, Artistic Freedom Initiative, or AFI, facilitates pro bono immigration representation and resettlement assistance for international artists who are persecuted or censored. Our work champions not only at-risk artists, but all forms of art and culture. We recognize that art and the wealth of knowledge and skills that form, inform its creation form a significant part of the intangible cultural heritage of all communities. We affirm the right to freely create and access art, including that which upholds cultural identity and heritage. By advocating for the protection and preservation of at-risk art forms, we champion artistic freedom for all communities. Today, I'd like to start by acknowledging that though Artistic Freedom Initiative operates internationally, our offices are on the unceded land of the Lenape people, Lenape Hoking. The Lenape people were forcibly displaced through a long history of settler colonialism and federal and state land dispossession, which continues to this day. We acknowledge this historical and ongoing dispossession, and we honor the current Lenape tribes and leaders who are still here, still connecting to the land, and who are still and have always been here stewarding the land. On behalf of us at AFI, I thank the team of Safe Havens Freedom Talks for co-organizing this first important event on Indigenous people's art forms and the law. The United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues met for its 20th session on the theme, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, the role of Indigenous peoples in implementing Sustainable Development Goal 16 in April, 2021. Of the three recommendations made on this theme, one called for increased study of the relationship of law, both formal and traditional, to, the justice, to justice for Indigenous peoples. Over the last few years, there have also been significant developments in jurisprudence that expands or amends existing legal frameworks, such as intellectual property rights to protect Indigenous art forms and Indigenous art makers. In this panel, we will explore the particular protections offered to Indigenous art forms by existing legal frameworks, both at the domestic and international levels. The panel will be composed of legal experts, advocates, and artists who will examine various threats to Indigenous art forms and analyze the legal mechanisms that have been used to protect them. It will serve as the first installment in a series that will go on to explore particular case studies where diverse Indigenous groups have, been, have established legal protections for their art forms. Hello, everybody. My name is Philip Blanchett, and my Yupik name is Gilichnok, and uh, we are Bamiwa, and Bamiwa is a Yupik word, and it means encore or do it again. And my name is Asana, or Asi for short. And my name is Kajung Adakale, Kajung for short. We're in Anchorage, Alaska right now, and we're, um, uh, the three of us are originally from the um, yukon Kuskokwim River Delta area, and um, these songs that we do represent our culture, and it represents us and our, ide our identity and our love for, um, for these songs, and yep. um, this first song, song is called... It's a song that Asi wrote, Bubblegum. Can you tell us a little bit about bubblegum? So I was teaching a dance class and I caught one of my students chewing gum, which is a no-no, and I kind of made fun of him and I told no, him. No, And I told him, I am going to immortalize you. And this kid is originally is from Shishmaraf, which is way up north. So this is called Damolo Chewing Gum Yagira Love While I'm Dancing. We got, a, we got a music video. You can check this out on YouTube. Bubble gum, Alaska, bum you check it out.
Many thanks to Bamiya for that wonderful artistic intervention. Bamiya showcases Inuit culture through music and dance performance. The show is a platform to share Indigenous knowledge and history. Their style derives from traditional melodies reinterpreted with contemporary vocalization and instrumentation. Often described as Inuit song music, Bamiya has discovered their own genre and we are so grateful to have had them with us today. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, starting with Anne Sambi, a traditional Sami Yoik artist and professor of the Faculty of Law at the University of Tromsø, specializing in, in indigenous rights law. We also have with us Professor Kristen Carpenter, who is the Council Tree Professor of Law and Director of the American Indian Law Program at the University of Colorado Law School. Professor Carpenter served as a member of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2017 to 2021, and as its chair from 2019 to 2020. Over the course of this event, we will speak with Ande about a specific case study where intellectual property has prevented access to Indigenous cultural heritage, and then ask Professor Carpenter about the extent to which intellectual property can serve to protect Indigenous cultural heritage on an international scale. So Ande, I was hoping that you would be able to speak to us a little bit about the over 7,000 recordings of Sami Yoik that are being kept by the, from the public at the Tromsø Museum. <laughs> This is a little sample of one of these 7,000 yoiks uh, that are in uh, Tromsø Museum. Tromsø Museum has the largest collection of yoiks uh, on this planet. And uh, the yoiks were uh, collected uh, um, when the recording industry, sort of the recording equipment uh, started to to work in, in such a way that it was possible to, to record. Um, Yoiks have uh, been carrying a lot of uh, connotations. Today, the con main connotations to Yoiks are that they are very proud of the Yoiks and they are very genuine, um, special for us, uh, very precious. Um, but uh, it hasn't been uh, always in that way. So, um, because uh, the Yoiks have uh, been so um, important in our pre Christian uh, shamanistic religious practices, so therefore the church has been very hostile against Yoiks. And so has the state. Uh, and so has all the powerful institutions in the society of uh, not only Norway, but also Sweden and Finland uh, and Russia been. Uh, but Joik carries this, um, this uh, beautiful, strong flame of resilience that we uh, all carry in our heart. But Joik is sort of an embodiment of that. So Tromsø Museum has taken the position that they are not uh, uh, sharing um, the samples of Joik. And 
that is um, an important um, issue uh, because uh, <clears throat> there is no formal training of Joikers uh, these days. So it means that the generation who are literate with the techniques of Joik, the semiotics of Joik, the philosophies of Joik, the logics of Joik, they are stepping out of time. So it would have been very important to, to let these people meet the Joiks um, that are in that museum. But the museum claims two uh, arguments uh, for not letting the Joiks uh, uh, get free from, from their basement. The argument one is that the uh, issue of uh, copyright is so complicated in an indigenous people's context. So it's safest to lock them down. And the other is that it happens uh, that some sensitive uh, information is uh, contained in a yoik. For example, if somebody is making some comment, pers very personal comments of a person, because we have uh, yoiks that refer to persons, we have yoiks that refer to animals and to uh, landscapes and rivers and so on. But Tromsø Museum has taken the position that uh, they um, don't take the chance to, to um, open up with, uh, with any of those yoiks. So my background as a, a legal professional, as well as a yoik uh, professional, I have been performing and uh, I have also been a producer of yoiks and even once started a little record company. Um, with, with yoiks. So um, um, the legal uh, arguments uh, uh, on the side uh, that the yoiks should be made accessible, it's the Sami people's uh, cultural heritage and very much uh, crucial, important um, information for the culture is contained in the yoiks very much of our memories. So it's the right to our past that uh, this is a question of. And the right to our past uh, is uh, backed up by the Norwegian constitution, the Norwegian national legislation, uh, a bunch of international conventions um, that uh, we will use too much time to list up here, but uh, the Convention on Civil and, Pol and Political Rights, Article 27, and the ILO Convention, and the UNDRIP, uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of other legal material uh, is not complicated to deduce that uh, that would be the, the right thing to do. But here we meet a phenomenon uh, uh, when it comes to cultural heritage. And that is that the, the transaction cost becomes very high. Uh, that if you need to go to court every time you want to cash out uh, a cultural uh, heritage, then it will be a very exhausting life uh, to be uh, in the Sami culture. So it becomes a matter of, of legal sociology because uh, the experience is that the litmus test of how substantial um, a package of rights is, is that if um, um, an individual decides to not comply with uh, the legal standards, if the institutions then will step uh, up and uh, and straight up uh, the, the record, or if they will uh, let that person um, uh, lock, uh, continue to lock down the yoiks. And unfortunately, that is what we have experienced from the University of, of Tromsø because it, uh, <clears throat> it um, shows us this dilemma that uh, in order to have a right, you have to get a right, but uh, you shouldn't be in the situation that you have to go to court every day, then you would uh, be um, 
a part of the the, the court the courtroom uh, uh, as as a, a living sculpture there all the time uh, litigating. So so that is uh, the um, the situation, and and it uh, it is interesting because uh, we are in a kind of welfare state. Uh, a state where the courts are are rumored to to function and so on on the on the indigenous people's side. Thank you, Anne. Um, I was wondering just to go back to one thing that you said. You said that the Tromsø Museum thinks it's too complicated with the copyright to release the recordings. What is it about the copyright that they are saying is too complicated? Well. Um, we have um, several ways to think about the, uh, the issue of copyright. Traditionally, if I made a yoik to you, um, which, which would be a, a, a personal uh, a song portrait of you, and then the issue would be, uh, did I carry the copyright or did you carry the copyright? So the Western system says that I carry the copyright. But the traditional Sami way of thinking says that you carry the copyright. And then they become scared of, of the, for example, this little dilemma there. And the solution they uh, then choose is to lock down and um, not let the genie out of the bottles, so to speak, uh, seen from their perspective. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, I know you said that for in order to litigate this case, you might need to become a living statue in the courts. But I'm wondering if, if any similar case like this has been litigated before, is there a precedent for using the law to um, gain access to recordings like these? Well, um, <clears throat> Our uh, use of the courts have been very much more ba basic questions like uh, uh, land rights, the right to exist. Um, so we have, uh, I used to think that we have, it's a matter of three uh, rights, the right to a past, a right to the presence and the right to a future. And we have been fighting so much for the right to a presence so we don't, uh, and we are not so many people. So uh, <clears throat> we simply do not have the human or economic resources to, to make all these fights that are required under the, the current regime. So uh, the cases that have been litigated now has been on reindeer grazing land and, uh, um, and uh, such issues that in a practical sense uh, are more important. And as I mentioned that uh, the Yoiks carry different types of connotations. So for example, Christianized Samis are not very fond of Yoik uh, because they also think that it's a pagan tradition. So, so Yoik doesn't have that many uh, supporters within our culture as well and that um, teaches us or reminds us that uh, you can get some kind of cultural viruses that, uh, that uh, if, for example, our elders become Christianized, then they can use the status of being an elder, which they uh, get from the tradition, the Sami tradition, and then they use it against Yoiks, for example. So, so uh, it is, um, uh, also complicated in, in that uh, respect. Thank you very much, Ande. I now want to turn to Professor Carpenter. Um, Professor Carpenter, first I want to acknowledge that in the US, the legal frameworks that govern property have colonial origins, and federal and state laws continue to cause harm to indigenous peoples. In your article, Owning Red, A Theory of Indian Cultural Appropriation, you trace some of this history in the United States, noting the role of the legal frameworks in the dispossession of Native American land. Your article, Clarifying Cultural Property, acknowledges that there are instances 
where the misappropriation and commodification of indigenous culture has been protected by copyright, trademark, and patent law. So given these complexities, to what extent is the intellectual property framework a val valuable tool to protect the art forms and traditional knowledge of indigenous communities, both domestically and internationally. Thanks, Sophia. It's a pleasure to join you and also to be here with Auntie Sambi, whose work is um, much respected in the international community. Um, You've identified some of the key tensions, I think, in the intellectual property law system as it affects indigenous peoples. And on the one hand, the origins of that system and property law generally in the United States and other Western countries um, has been to um, incentivize innovation through economic rewards and largely to recognize the so-called creators of um, works, whether um, expressions like yoiks or art or um, medicines, and to grant um, the people who apply for intellectual property protections a limited monopoly over them so that they can gain economic benefits um, for some amount of time before it reverts to the public domain and then others have a chance to further innovate. And indigenous peoples, I think, sometimes are motivated by similar concerns. They might be painters or jewelers or singers who are um, you know, eager to participate in the market. But other times their creations are motivated by spiritual values or to teach children or to keep the world in balance. And our intellectual property law systems typically don't um, offer protections for those kinds of values. Um, indigenous people's own laws, customs and traditions typically do offer the kinds of protections that they're seeking. And um, one of the current challenges is to find space in our law as it's developing domestically and internationally so that those indigenous legal values and legal systems can come into play. I guess I'll say just briefly, um, in those cases where indigenous peoples um, are able to avail themselves of the protections of intellectual property law, it may be because, um, again, they, they have been participating in the market. One case that I like to mention is um, Navajo Nation versus Urban Outfitters. It was a case here in the United States where Urban Outfitters, the teeny bopper retail company, decided to market um, underwear and um, flasks using the Navajo name and um, patterns that were vaguely indigenous looking. So the Navajo panty and the Navajo flask um, were being widely marketed, much to the offense of the Navajo people, um, probably for obvious reasons. But this was one of those cases where the Navajos had actually registered Navajo and Navajo Nation as a trademark because they were already selling t-shirts and other things in the market. So they were able to use trademark and concepts of infringement and tarnishment to negotiate a settlement. But in other instances um, where expressions are more of the cultural nature that I've been talking about, um, it's much harder to find a way in through um, domestic or international uh, intellectual property law for indigenous peoples. Thank you, Professor Carpenter. I'm glad you brought up that case. Um, it's one that AFI has explored in our Art and Cultural Heritage Law course with Georgetown Law, actually. And um, it, I know it's not the, the only case like that where um, major fashion labels have appropriated um, indigenous imagery. Um, so given this, this domestic context, I wanna turn now to the international and ask, um, given your work with the World Intellectual Property Organization's Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and Genetic Resources, as well as traditional knowledge and folklore, how is that the process um, at the WIPO and the WIPO's IGC, um, how does that process add to the legal protections or what can that process add to the legal protections that are available to Indigenous communities? and 
how could it better protect the rights and interests of indigenous peoples? Well, the World Intellectual Property Organization, um, through its intergovernmental committee, embarked on a process to draft um, three instruments about 20 years ago. And the idea was to, um, to offer better protections for indigenous peoples and local communities, um, but again, to um, also do so with consideration for the users of indigenous peoples, um, intellectual and cultural property, which include um, industry and governments. And so from the outset, we should probably acknowledge that this process isn't exclusively devoted to the rights of indigenous peoples. It's an international state-centric process that nonetheless, I think, is striving to recognize indigenous people's rights in those realms. What I would like to see the WIPO IGC process do is to risk recognize um, and incorporate some of the international human instruments, uh, sorry, human rights instruments that Andy Zombie referenced, um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with um, the provisions on minority rights, and maybe even more specifically, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which in its Article 31 um, provides that Indigenous peoples have the rights to their cultural heritage, their traditional cultural expressions, and their traditional knowledge. In those categories um, of intellectual and cultural property, which may include collective creations and intergenerational transfer of knowledge, spiritual, um, religious values, those are recognized as types of um, properties and interests that Indigenous peoples um, claim and are important for their self-determination. And the WIPO process hopefully will recognize those as well through these um, legal instruments that are um, better adapted, I hope, to Indigenous peoples' claims and interests than are the conventional laws of copyright, patent, and trademark. But um, as with many processes, this one too is about power and um, about the ability of Indigenous peoples to seek allies and to state their interests strongly and diplomatically um, in a way that will ultimately achieve better recognition. Thank you, Professor Carpenter. So, um, and the, I came across the transcript of your 2001 statement at the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations in Geneva. One of the elements that stood out to me is when you ask, do human rights only refer to individual rights or are they also collective rights in this concept? And I wanted to bring this question to the panel. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because uh, there we also meet the dilemma of uh, how we think about rights and uh, uh, and on what levels uh, in uh, indigenous peoples uh, should negotiate uh, which of, of the, the the games uh, is to be played. Uh, so if we uh, then pretend uh, that we are in this traditional axis between the individual and the state and, and have this division that uh, some rights belong to the individuals, others belong to the states, and there is nothing between. Um, but if we then start to negotiate about the rules of the game, um, where we ask, uh, yeah, is it only this axis that is, is valid? Are there any other um, um, actors in the, in the game? Um, and the, the collective uh, is, is one part, but, but uh, one could scare the people by, by saying that, uh, well, uh, it could be people from the past, for example, in in our traditional ontology of the Sami people. Um, it is uh, that, that we also uh, interact with our spirits, uh, people who have passed away and people who hasn't uh, uh, been born yet. Uh, so we sort of uh, count them into the equation. Uh, and uh, 
it is this uh, question of what should be included in the equation when we are uh, trying to, to solve, uh, solve uh, a problem. So um, what I just wanted to, to address there is that uh, one couldn't um, see um, this axis as, as, uh, as a given that, uh, that, uh, that we would have to, to, to be able to also to negotiate the game uh, of, of legal argumentation, of legal reasoning. And indigenous peoples are not the only ones who have uh, uh, also uh, brought up uh, this issue of negotiating the rules of the game. For example, one of the results of uh, post-colonialism was that the new players, when they came in, they wanted to argue uh, the rules of the game, as did when we got a lot of uh, women into the to the to the legal world. Uh, then, for example, normality was was a normal. Uh, a person um, automatically a man um, that that one then looked at formal rights and and uh, rights that were implied by the rules. So, uh, <clears throat> um, but my position on this uh, because one could be pragmatic and say that okay, let's fight the fights that are possible. But I think that we live uh, in. You know, on a very long stretch, so we have to start uh, start negotiating also these issues, even if uh, um, we never will see uh, uh, those uh, results of those things be cashed out. Thank you, Ande. And uh, I'll turn the same question now to you, Professor Carpenter. Thank you. I believe that human rights are collective as much as they are individual. And um, I believe that for a few reasons. First, among indigenous people, so many aspects of life are collective in nature. And um, I think that our laws can be flexible and they should be shaped and reformed to reflect the kind of society that we want to inhabit. And so there um, are instruments that have recognized that. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples says it right at the beginning that um, Indigenous peoples have individual and collective human rights. And it is time for domestic and international laws to get on board with that. I also practice and teach law in a country, the United States, where corporations and churches have um, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, those are collective entities comprised of shareholders or members. There is absolutely no reason why Indigenous peoples can't have at least those same rights. But for Indigenous peoples, I think of, it's more complicated, of course, because rights usually in their cosmologies come with relationships. And one of the things I really like about the Declaration is it talks about um, relationships with the natural world, obligations to future generations. And I too am familiar with many indigenous cultures where the spirit world um, is alive and very much part of the society and human beings have obligations to take care of the spiritual world, whether that's through ceremonial grounds or repatriation or you know, other um, legal and non-legal means. And I, I just, think it's both descriptively accurate and normatively desirable to recognize that human rights are both individual and collective in nature. Thank you so much. At this point, I wanted to ask you if you have questions for each other. I wanted to, to have some reflections on, um, on this dilemma that we have uh, that uh, that uh, sort of the legal system it strives to a kind of universality, um, and and in some respect 
it's uh, it's a very good thing for example that uh, universal human rights can be the absolute floor of that you can't go lower than than this or or, or that uh, norm um at the same time um we exist in in very different worlds where we were sort of um because if you um, if you lean to universality then you lean towards text but if you lean towards um um the difference in the different words then you lean towards context um uh, and uh, and and somehow uh, it is uh, it is both cognitively a, a dilemma but it's also uh, strategically a, a, a little di dilemma uh, uh, in that so um uh, i know it's <laughs> it's a hard one but but i throw the ball <laughs> Thank you. That is one of the um, absolutely most confounding questions, I think, about human rights and about um, Indigenous peoples when we think about culture and the very many different ways that human beings organize themselves and relate to the environment, um, their environments, vis-a-vis -vis the desire, as Andy says, to have universal norms so that all human beings are guaranteed some level of dignity and, and basic respect. And I, I definitely don't have the absolute answers, but the way I think about it um, is sometimes taking off my law professor hat and putting on my um, lawyer hat. You know, how do these things actually play out in practice? And um, among the people that I work with, which are largely indigenous peoples throughout the world, I think um, their realities reflect a sense of legal pluralism in that universal rights, let's say the right to religion, could be respected among all people. But what that means for, um, I'll just pick two examples, Karelian people in Russia and Cherokee people in the United States may be very different. And I think we can recognize as a matter of context, as you said, Andy, that um, the experience, what people need to enjoy the freedom of religion, which I think is an individual and collective human right, may differ in one place versus another, and that our societies and our laws are hopefully sufficiently capacious to manage that, even with a universal baseline. And going back to the intellectual property conversation, I think some of those ideas could pertain there. I mean, when it comes to what Indigenous people are seeking, at least from my experience of working with them, when it comes to intellectual property, sometimes they're seeking privacy. They want to keep their intellectual and cultural property confidential within the community. They don't want it to be injected into the market. They don't want it to be alienable. I think that should be reflected in the law. Sometimes they do want to inject it in the market. They would like acknowledgement and attribution. They would like to participate in benefit sharing. Those are some of the things that WIPO could accomplish. Um, I think that we could offer that too in a menu of legal um, solutions while acknowledging the fundamental right of individuals and collectives to their intellectual, their cultural and spiritual properties. So I don't know if I'm answering on the conceptual level as much as on the practice level, um, but um, those are some of, my, some of my thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, Professor Carpenter, I don't know if you had a question for Andy. I don't know if I'm going to state this as articulately as I'd like to, but um, one of the things that I find the most powerful about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is its several articles recognizing the laws, customs, and traditions of Indigenous peoples. And I was wondering if in your understanding, 
of the yoik and the tradition of yoik. Does that, um, is, is that a legal tradition? Does it give us sort of rules to live by? Or is it more of a cultural tradition? Or is it something that is kind of uniquely Sami and, and transcends those categories? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very interesting question because uh, yoiks have, have um, many, many aspects. Um, one way to look at yoik is that it's a kind of um, a way to meditate. Um, and, and as a human, you would uh, share with your fellow human beings if you then know of a very uh, good way to meditate. Uh, yeah. And um, but it's all uh, we, we say about the yoik that uh, we got it from the uh, people underground. The, the, we, it's in, in our, um, our cosmology. So uh, basically it's the uh, song of the earth. Uh, so the earth has given us these songs and that we have to sort of uh, keep the songs uh, alive so that we also keep the human resilience uh, uh, sort of alive. So when you are uh, are are yoiking, then you are are not only operating um, on behalf of your culture or or behalf of your or your aesthetic preferences or or um, existential needs. Uh, for example, myself, uh, I use yoik when I have a, a complicated problem. Also, when I was uh, practicing as a lawyer, then I used to, uh, and we have great distances uh, in northern Norway to drive from A to B. So then I used to, to yoik through the case, to analyze the case by, by yoiking it and, and then uh, it was a very, uh, very practical uh, thing, thing for me. Um, but it has also been um, the blanket of shame that uh, that uh, I belong to the generation who turned that around and and brought it uh, in the limelight uh, um, and and so on. So. Uh, so um, it is, uh, I was very happy uh, to see uh, all the uh, references uh, that, the, that uh, in the UN declaration that one could apply uh, to Yoiks. But, but I think uh, about Yoiks that, um, um, that uh, one has to think in, in steps. Step one would be to preserve that and to 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 make it healthy enough. Um, it's like um, a person who has almost uh, drowned, and you rescue that person and you make sure that uh, that uh, the health is coming up. And then I think that uh, that uh, it is something very valuable in Yoik that we can share with the with the humanity uh, on a little longer horizon. And I think that that's not unique to Yoik. I think that uh, there are very many uh, practices of different nature in the indigenous world that is in parallel situations where <clears throat> that uh, uh, we belong to the time when we have to uh, protect and nurture. Uh, it's like a, a beautiful little flame that we have to make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, blow out. But when it uh, starts to get healthy, then I think we can provide to, to humanity very many beautiful and, and strong, interesting things from the from the indigenous cultures as well. So, and that makes indigenous uh, rights not 
only indigenous rights, but, but uh, very important for the whole humanity. So that whole humanity has uh, important shares um, in the indigenous rights. Thank you. That was so beautifully said and shared. I'll be thinking about it for a long time. And if I may, you just reminded me too that um, we're about to embark on the International Decade of Indigenous Languages and the UN has declared the next 10 years a time for all of the world's people and states to be focusing on the revitalization, use and transmission of these languages, whether in song or in writing or, or daily speech. Um, and I agree with you that this is a, something that all of the world should be concerned about. Thank you both so much. Um, it's been such an honor to have you both here for this panel event. And um, we're just so grateful that you've shared your time and your thoughts and your words so generously with us and your York <laughs> so generously um, this evening. And um, yes, with this, I think we conclude our panel event.